Hey everyone, this is Brian, and in this video, we are going to make a complete application using all the knowledge we've gained in this series so far. Now, this application is going to be a very simple, I have to stress the term simple, inventory application. At its core, it's going to be a QMAP that we're going to save to a file and load back. We're using a QMAP because we want a key value pair, like an item number or an item name with a quantity attached to it. And of course, we're going to have some extra code in there so we can add and remove items from that inventory. I'm going to do this in this series from time to time because our YouTube series is, well, I like it, but each video is very self-contained, meaning one video covers, say, files, the next video covers, say, queue list. They're very self-contained, and these specific videos where we build an application takes all these parts and kind of puts them all into one so you see how all the pieces fit together to make a complete app. So I am going to do this from time to time. I haven't really decided on like X number of videos, so it's not gonna be like every 10th video or anything like that, but drop a comment below. Let me know how often you wanna see these. Now, because we're still in newbie land in this series, this is gonna be a command line application, but yes, as this series progresses, we're gonna do QML and widget applications as well. Now, if you haven't watched these videos and you're a complete newbie when it comes to Qt, I suggest you watch these, and if you want more, classroom style training, I do offer complete classes out on Udemy. Specifically, this topic would be touched on in the Qt 6 core for beginners with C++ and the Qt 6 core intermediate with C++. This video also is going to hyper-focus on QDataStream, which is how we put streams of data into an IO device, specifically a file. Let's dive in and take a look. Okay, let's start at the very beginning. I don't even have Qt Creator open. I'm going to walk through this whole thing step by step. So this is Linux Mint, but again, Qt runs anywhere. So you may be on Windows, Mac, whatever. This code will run just perfectly fine on all of those platforms. So we're going to go to Programming. We're going to open up Qt Creator. And then from here, I'm going to say New, and we're going to choose Console Application. Now I need to give it a name. Name this whatever you want, but this is going to be the name of your executable. For my purposes, because I want this to follow a specific standard out on GitHub, that's right, the code for this will be out on GitHub. I'm going to say QT6, and we're going to say episode, and this is episode 20. Put it in whatever folder you want and hit next. We're going to use the CMake build system. I'm not going to have a translation file. Kit selection, I only have Qt6 in here. If you have an older version like Qt5, you may run into some little issues, some little differences between 5 and 6. Remember, this series is covering Qt6. Hit next. Not going to use any project management. And here we go. We just have a blank application. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to right click our project and I'm going to add new and I want to make a class. And let's go ahead and call this inventory. This is really a design decision, and unfortunately, when it comes to design decisions, there's a million different ways you can do this. I'm putting my business logic into a class, and I'm going to make this a queue object. That way, I can call it via signals and slots if I decide to make this application more complex in the future. Need to make sure this includes queue object and add the queue underscore object macro. That officially makes it a queue object. We have our header and our source. Hit next and then just hit finish. This little guy is annoying cute if you're watching. Please, pretty please, make this go into cmakelist.txt automatically. But for now, inventory. See, I've got to type this out. Hit save. Make sure it adds the header and the source file, and we are good to go. Now we've got our class here, but it's, well, just a class. There's really nothing in here. It's just a blank class. We need to flesh this code out. And I'm gonna break this up into specific sections, but this section right here, we're gonna talk about the class design. So the first thing I want is some includes. And from time to time, I do copy and paste. I have some notes off the screen just to save a smidge of time typing. We're gonna use QMAP, QDebug, so we can see some output on the screen, QFiles, so we can work with, you guessed it, a file, and then queue data stream. This is something we haven't really touched on in this series, but I did cover in the Udemy courses. So what is queue data stream? If you highlight it and hit F1, you can see the integrated help. 
It's a class that provides serialization of binary data to an I.O. device. An I.O. device, of course, would be a file. Yes, you could also do this to like a socket or something like that. It's really just that cool once you get more advanced. But at its core, a data stream will serialize the data, meaning it's going to take it and turn it into a language or code that the machine understands, but this is not human readable. It's much more efficient to store and to retrieve. That's why we're going to serialize it. If you want more help, just highlight QDataStream, hit F1, and read down through the file. But we're going to cover some of the basics of this class, and there's a lot to it, so I stress the basics. From here, we need to make a couple other design decisions as well. I'm going to have some functions, and I'm going to just do some copy and paste. We're going to say add, remove, and list. Our inventory system, we want to be able to add, you guessed it, some item with a quantity and remove some item with a quantity. And then list, basically we want to know what we have in our inventory. From there, I'm going to make a minor design decision that at this point in the series may not make a whole lot of sense. I'm going to say public slots. So notice we already have signals and now we have slots. So signals and slots, we've touched on these, but basically a signal lets the outside world know, hey, something happened, some event happened. It's emitting a signal. A slot would consume that or take some sort of action. This is event-driven programming. So cause and effect, signal, slot. So when a signal is emitted, you can connect to a slot and have that slot be called automatically. From here, I'm going to paste in save and load. So the first question I'm often asked is, whoa, 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 what's the difference between a slot and a function? Virtually none, to be brutally honest with you. You can call a slot like a function, but in order to use Qt's built-in event-driven system called signals and slots, you have to have a slot. And this is where mock, the meta object compiler comes in. Basically, because we have this Q object macro, when we compile, it's going to see this and it's going to scan our class and go, oh, you have some slots. And it's going to convert these functions into magical functions called slots, which does all that event-driven programming in the background for us. Whew. If it sounds confusing, because it's actually pretty confusing under the hood, but let's go ahead and flesh this out and I'll show you what I mean here. I'm also going to have a private variable called m underscore items, which is going to be a QMAP with a key value pair of QString and int. So there's our item name and our quantity. From here, we're just going to right click refractor and then add definition. I'm gonna do this for each one of these. Now you may be asking yourself why, as I'm doing this, why did we make those two slots but the others are just normal functions? Again, it's just simply a design decision. When you get a little bit more advanced, you will literally take these and just copy and paste them under slots. That way all of them are slots because you'll see the power of slots. It's how you would get one Q object to automatically, that's a word now, automatically talk to another Q object via signals and slots. But you see in the implementation, it's just normal functions. So we can call save and load like normal functions, or we have the options of using event-driven programming signals and slots. I'm going to go ahead and save, and I'm going to build. We got a good build, so we are ready to start fleshing out code. But before we do, let's jump out to the hard disk. I want to talk about mock super quick. We're going to go to Qt. This is our build folder. And here is our actual binary. On Windows, you're going to see like .exe. And you see we have some stuff here. Now let's look at this autogen. Oh, la la, look at that. Mock meta object compiler. So this is what's going on here is it's actually going out and generating this code. And you see here is our mock underscore inventory. Our class was named inventory and our slots are save and load. And if we crack this bad boy open, you'll see save and load. So that's what mocks doing in the background is it's taking any function that we define as a slot and it's generating this mock code for us so that as we make more complex applications, we can connect using signals and slots. I wanted to really cover that in this video, even though we're not gonna use signals and slots very heavily because I'm gonna get those questions later on. 
let's start filling in some code. I'm going to break this into two sections here. So we're going to do this code first, and then in the next little section, we're going to do this code. Why? Because this is the inventory code. This is really our internal business logic, and this is our serialization code. And I want to really, in your mind, split those into two separate pieces. Anyways, we can just switch to header and source. And all uh, right, let's go here. So first thing I want to do is make a design choice. Again, there's a billion different ways to really build this application. But in the constructor, I want this to automatically load our information, which we're not going to fill out just yet, but we're going to load. And this is going to load any file that we previously saved. Now, notice we're calling this like a normal function. That's what I mean by slots really are normal functions with mock meta object compile wrapped around them. Now, from here, we need to start fleshing in some code. So when we add an item, we'll say if m underscore items, my horrible typing included it, no extra charge. <laughs> Let's kind of say contains, I've had this horrible, I shouldn't say horrible, it was a great gaming keyboard when I bought it, but I have just beat the hell out of this thing on different video games. So I probably need to invest in a new keyboard at some point. And my mouse is the same way. So once in a while, you'll see me actually fight with the mouse. I think it's kind of busted, to be honest with you. All right, so what we're doing here is we're saying if our map, M items, contains the name or the key, then we're going to go ahead and say, go ahead and take that item and add the quantity to it. However, if we don't already have that in our inventory, we're going to insert it. We're going to say m.items.insert. And we're going to insert a key value pair, in this case, our name and our quantity. Now, somebody out there is going to say, well, if you call insert, it will automatically do it for you. The problem is it will overwrite the quantity instead of add to it. So like if you go here, F1, it says inserts a new item. If there's already an item with the key, that item's value is replaced. So you got to be a little careful there. All right, now that we've got this, we want to do the exact opposite, which is remove. So I'm going to grab this, copy, paste. And we're going to say, if it contains our key here, then we want to do the opposite. We want to reduce it. But we've got a problem. What if they go beyond zero? So now I'm going to say, if m items.value, we want to get that value is less than zero, then we're just going to go ahead and remove it. And this will actually take it right out of our map altogether. Now, I'm a big fan of letting the user know what's going on. So I'm just going to say item removed. Now, as you're watching me fumble around with this keyboard, let me know if you prefer watching me type or if you prefer watching me do the old copy and paste like I'm doing there. And I know some instructors actually have programs which will automatically type out all the code for you. I don't use those. I think they're a bit cheesy. But again, you wouldn't be watching me make a lot of mistakes. So a quick recap. We are adding and we are removing. If we're removing an item and we go below zero, we're just going to remove it right out of the map so we don't have negative numbers in our inventory. All right, to wrap this little section up, we're going to go ahead and list. So I'm going to say Q info. items and we want to know how many items we have so i'm going to say m items dot size there is a count which will return the same number but you can also count for specific items in there so we're just going to use size to avoid any confusion i'm going to say for each i'm going to say q string key in m items dot keys and i'm pretty sure we covered this in our youtube series i know i definitely beat this up in the uh, Udemy courses, but keys is just going to return a queue list of queue strings or whatever our key is. Remember, we defined our queue map key value pair as a queue string for the key and a value as an int. So we're just going to say for each queue string key in the list of keys. And then I just really want to print this out on the screen just so the user can see what we have in inventory. It's actually pretty simple when you look at it in this terms. So the major takeaway here is there's different ways of doing this. We could have done the C++ way. We could use for each. We could have done a 
uh, for loop using you know begin and end doesn't really matter as long as you get the result you want the end user simply doesn't care let's work on our serialization code so we've got two functions save and load save and load are pretty self-descriptive save is going to save to a file and load is going to load it back so let's save it first i'm going to say q file and let's call this file and we need a name inventory.txt we can name this dot dat or whatever we wanted i'm just gonna name it dot txt so we can just crack it open very quickly in a notepad and see what it looks like then i'm gonna say if and we're gonna go ahead and open this file file is not openable is that a word openable we're gonna say qio device we want to open this in write only mode if we're not able to do this, well, we have some problems and we need to tell the user, hey, no bueno, couldn't do it. So we're going to say Q critical could not save the file. And then we want to get the error string out of the Q file object. That way we can tell the user, hey, something bad happened. Go deal with it. And then we're just going to hit the eject button on this and jump right out of here. Now comes the interesting bit. Um, this is something I don't think we've really covered a whole lot. We're going to say Q data stream, and we're going to give it our file. So what this does is it opens a file, but now we are going to put or serialize some data into that file, and we're going to use Q data stream to stream the data and let it encode it and decode it for us. But before we get to that point, we need to tell it how. So I'm going to say stream set version and this is critical a lot of people and i'm guilty of it too will skip this step but we're going to explicitly say we want to work with cute version you notice it goes all the way back to 1.0 we want to set a version and say this is the version we're going to work with that way if somebody hands us a file that was encoded with an older version or a future version we know hey it's going to have a different encoding under the hood and we're going to check for that in the load section here. But anyways, what I want to do first is I want to write the number of items to the stream. So I'm going to say int len equals m items, and we want to get that size. So I just want to know the number of items in that map. And then writing it is extremely simple. Watch this. That's it. We're just going to pump it out to the stream and let the stream deal with all of the IO, all the encoding. It can just do what it does best. And then I'm going to just give the user some sort of feedback that we're doing something. Number of items to save. I'm going to do a for each. Some people love for each, but some people hate it. I've just gotten really used to doing it over the years, but there are newer, snazzier ways of C++ to do it. And we're going to say m items keys. Bang. So really all we're going to do is we're going to go through each and every single little key here. And we are going to save it. So I'm going to go bang. And then let's go ahead and say stream. And we want to pump that key out to the stream. Stream. And now we want the value. So we're going to just take the key value pair and put them in there. But notice the order we're doing this in. So we're putting the number of items, then we're doing key value, key value. And we're just gonna loop through that. When we load this back, the order in which we saved, we have to read it in the same order. We're gonna get corrupt data. So be very mindful of that. You'll see what I mean here in just a second. So we're gonna say file close and then Q info. I'm really envious of some of those instructors who will like have a program type it all out for them. I might actually look into that. I know, I know. I've asked that before and everybody's like, no, don't do that. We like watching you type because we like watching you suffer. But anyways, all right. So I'm just going to copy all of that code. Quick recap. What we're doing here is we're opening a file called inventory.txt. You can 100% put that somewhere else. We're going to say if we're unable to open the file in write only mode, then we want to let the user know. We're going to make a data stream, set the version, and then we're going to pump our data out. And we're doing this in a specific order, the number of items, and then key value, key value, key value over and over until we're done. And then we're going to close the file. Note, 
In the close, it will also flush. So any data that's sitting here pending in the buffer is going to get flushed down to the disk. Flush just means it's going to force it to write down to the disk. Now load, load's a little interesting. It does the exact opposite. So I'm going to paste this in here. We're gonna say, if file open in read-only mode failed, then could not open the file. This is where I always make mistakes because I get it all screwed up. Let's back up here real quick. I want to actually check to see if the file exists. So I'm gonna say if not file.exists, then we're going to, and I'm gonna change this to a warning. Some people are gonna say, what is the difference really between like a QInfo, QDebug, QWarning? These are levels of logging in case you just kind of skip those. We really, really beat those up in the Udemy courses, but you can actually build your own logging system and then set levels and categories and all this other cool stuff. But we're just going to say, file does not exist. That way the end user knows, hey, we got no inventory. There's nothing to work with here. Hit the eject button. If we're unable to open it in read-only mode, hit the eject button. Now comes to the meat of it here. In our save code, we did a set version. So I'm going to grab this version and we're gonna check for this. We're gonna say, if, get the mouse out of there. Get out of there, mouse. All right, so we're gonna say if, and we wanna know the stream.version is not equal to the version we're using, then we've got problems. And we're going to simply say Q critical now, in a real-world application, you would try to, you know, match the version and then use the function that uses that specific version and so on and so on. Or say, hey, here's our data migration wizard that our company has built that will migrate your data to the newest version. But instead, we're going to say wrong data stream version. Because there is one and only one in the land of our inventory app. Then we're going to just say file close because at this point we have an open file and we're going to hit the eject button. Some of you out there are probably going to be really, really good at reading the documentation. We really don't even need this because as soon as the queue file goes out of scope, it's going to close itself automatically. I like to make sure that I'm closing it because I want to be in control. All right, from here, we have an inventory system. We need to clean that out. So I'm going to say M items. Clear. And that's just going to unapologetically wipe anything we already have in memory out of there. And then we can start loading it. So we want to know the maximum. And then we're going to start working with some stuff. So I'm going to say stream and we're going to read in that max. You may be wondering, wait a minute, how do you know what to do? Well, if you go back to our save code, the first thing we did was we saved the number of items. So we're simply just reading that back. And then we're going to do the same for each key value pair. So we are saying int max, we're reading the number of items we're going to read back in. And then we can say q info number of items to load and then I'm going to just wipe this stuff out so we don't get that confused. Actually, I'm gonna say loaded. Okay, so now comes, well, you may be thinking this is the confusing bit, but this couldn't be any simpler. I'm just gonna say four, and i equals zero, i is less than our max, i plus plus. So we're just gonna increment our i. Now we're gonna work with a key value pair, so I'm gonna say we want a q string key, and int, QTY, and we're going to read those in. So I'm going to say stream E, and then stream QTY. Again, you got to read these back in the order you saved them. And remember, in our save code, we saved the key, then we saved the quantity, key, quantity. So, of course, down here, we have to do key, quantity, key, quantity. Now that we have those loaded up, we're going to say m items insert, and we're going to just simply add our new key value pair. 
from here, file is going to close, and we're going to say we have fully loaded that out to the end user, so they're aware of what's going on. Quick double check before we move on. Let's make sure we've fleshed out every single little function. And remember, our constructor is going to call that load function we just fleshed out. So as soon as the class is constructed, it's going to go out there and try to load that file if we previously saved it. OK, now comes the fun part. We need to flesh out our main function. This is actually the bulk of our application here. So I'm going to just copy and paste some stuff. This is our simple inventory application. We've made a class. We filled in the code. Now we need to monitor the user input. And we're going to use the queue text stream. The difference between queue text stream and queue data stream is that data stream is non-readable, where text stream is human readable. So this is what we're going to use to get the end user's commands. And we're, of course, going to use our inventory class that we just built. I'm going to judiciously copy and paste some code to save some time. We're going to create an instance of our inventory class. We're going to tell the user, because users are dumb, these are the things you're allowed to do. Notice some of the commands, like add, remove, you have multiple items. Add, space, item, space, item. Remove, same thing, but others are just one. So we're going to have to split those up. Just be aware of that. So I'm going to say, whoops, not Qtex format, Qtex stream. This is why I copy and paste things, because I can't type and talk at the same time. Darn it. All right, so we're going to say stdn. And what this is going to do is it's going to wrap the standard input with a Qtex stream. So we can use that functionality. And this is where we need to make a design decision. I'm going to loop forever, but this is really poor practice. We're just simply not there in our little tutorials. There's a better way of doing this that we're going to cover when we get a little bit more advanced. So I'm going to say Qinfo. And we are going to tell the user, because users are dumb, enter a command. Probably not nice for me to say users are dumb, but you know what I mean. You all have that one user where you got to like walk them through every little thing. Now, the big problem here is because this is going to loop forever, we've got to be able to know when to stop looping. So let's go ahead and say qString. Let's call this line, and we're going to say stream.readLine. So we're going to take our text stream, and we're going to read a single line. Now, from here, we need to take that line and break it up because some of these will have multiple parts. And then we're going to use what's called split. So I'm going to say QStringList. I'm going to say line split. And we're going to split on the space because that's the format we've chose. Again, design decision. We could have split on a comma or whatever we wanted to do. Now that we've gotten this far, what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, I want to know what the end user actually just entered. So I'm going to say qString command equals list at, and I want the first position, dot two upper. Now we have a subtle bug in our program. I don't know if you caught it, but we're assuming that there's even an item in here. So we should probably back up here and say if list.size is less than or equal to zero, then we're going to go ahead and break out of here. That way, if something weird happened, the entered some gibberish or our program freaked out. Remember, these are cross platforms, so they're not going to behave exactly the same on every single platform. We just want to make sure that we have some sort of list to work with. Our command is going to be the first item at the zero position to upper. And from here, we can do some very, very cool things like if mand equals quit, then we can say either a dot quit. You're wondering what a is. It's our actual Q core application. And you see we're entering an event loop here. So we can either quit or we can say a dot exit and specify an exit code. Either way, we're going to break out of here. Spoiler alert, this may actually misbehave on some systems. And when we get more advanced, we'll talk about how to fix that. But just beware, it's going to behave a little bit differently on everybody's systems. I've seen it behave mostly the way you expect, but sometimes it does just do weird stuff. But now it's really 
pretty basic, actually. I mean, we can just save just a smidge of time and say, okay, we're going to say if the command is list, we're going to list. If it's load, we're going to load, save, we're going to save. Now, if you copy and paste, you get this like weird formatting like what I got. You can just control A, and then you can go to refractor. And then, I'm sorry, not refractor, auto indent selection or control I. And it will fix it for you. Absolutely love that feature because I copy and paste a lot in my videos. But you notice what we're not doing yet. We're not adding or removing. And these are the tricky ones because in our little protocol, they have multiple parts, add and remove. So rather than treat each one separately, what we're going to do is check both of them. So I'm going to say if command equals add or command And this is where horrible spelling like I have will come back and haunt you. And that's why in more advanced programs, we'll actually use an enum instead of using a hard-coded string. Again, design decision based off the knowledge we have so far. If we're using these commands, we know we need at least three things, right? We need a command, a key, and a value. So I want to make sure we have those. List.size is less than, we said we need three things. Then we're going to tell the user, hey, do not pass go. Instead, go directly to jail. Do not collect $200. That's a, a board game, in case you don't know what that is. It's actually a pretty fun game. All right, so we're going to say command, add, or remove. If we don't have enough items, we're just going to say not enough info. And we're going to continue, meaning we're going to restart this whole loop all over again and ask them for another command. If we've gotten this far, we're going to go ahead and get that information. So I'm going to say qString name equal list dot at and we're gonna go ahead and get the first item now remember first is not first it's actually the second because it's a zero based index the zero position is actually our command the one position is our key now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna say bool okay and qty the reason why we're gonna use a bool is we're going to convert from a string to an integer, but we need to make sure it actually works the way we expect. So I'm going to say qty equals list dot at, and we're going to get it at the second position. I'm going to convert this to int, and we're going to give it our bool. So we're going to say, if it doesn't work, I want to know. So if this is true, it worked. If it's false, it didn't work. And then we can just simply check that by doing something like this. And again, horrible formatting. We're going to say, if it's not OK, meaning if it's false, invalid quantity. So here we're doing some conversion. I get asked that quite a bit. How do you convert from int to string? And then once we have this, again, it is ridiculously simple. We're going to say, if the commands add, inventory add. If the commands remove, inventory remove. Now, when we get to this point, Sometimes we have to save the users from themselves. So this is another design decision. I'm going to automatically save this once we break out of that loop. So I'm going to say inventory dot save. Because you always get that one user that goes, well, I know I saved it. And no, they did not. So we're just going to save it for them just to be safe. Some people will love that feature. Some people will hate it. A production app, you would be able to turn this on or off. All right, let's go ahead and give it a good build before we move on. Make sure I didn't goof anything up. All right, we've got a good build. We can move on to testing. OK, that was a lot of code. If you're still with me, it's time to test this application. Let's go ahead and run it. All right, so it says file does not exist because we haven't created one yet. Here's our available commands because, well, let's face it, end users need to be told what to do and enter a command. So first things first, let's go ahead and add something. So I'm going to say add hat. And we want to add 22 cats because, you know, life's just not worth living if you don't have 22 cats. Now, enter a command. Let's go ahead and add. And we're going to add three dogs. I actually love dogs just as much as I love cats. But all right, we're going to go ahead and list. So we have two items, cat and dog. Let's go ahead and quit. Now, notice it says number of items to save two. Saving cat, saving dog, file saved. 
file save. So that auto save actually worked for us. Notice we didn't type the save command. Let's go out here and you see, sure enough, here's our inventory file. Let's crack this open. This is what I mean by it's serialized data. This is not human readable. And our little text editor, this is, uh, I'm on Linux Mint. So this is a Z. It's struggling to try to figure out what this is because it's expecting text and this is not text. It's binary encoded serialized data. Let's go back here, close this and run it. Notice it says number of items loaded too. So our auto load is not working. Let's go ahead and list this. We've got 22 cats and three dogs. Sweet. All right, so let's go ahead and remove. Let's remove two dogs. Oh, notice I misspelled that. So our not enough info actually helped us here. So we're going to go ahead and try that again. Remove dog two. Now it actually removed. We're going to go ahead and list it. We have one dog left. And then cats, 22 cats is a lot of cat food. So let's go ahead and remove some cats here. So I'm going to say remove. Let's remove 19 cats. Now we have three cats and one dog. And we're going to test that to see if we can actually remove and get into a negative value. So I'm going to remove dog and we're going to remove 99 dogs. Item removed. Now if we go ahead and list. Notice it took the dog out so we don't have a negative number. Instead, we just have cat. And we can, if we wanted to, go ahead and save this manually. And if we wanted to, we can also load it. So there you go. Very simple inventory using Qt. No application is complete without bugs. So we've got a pretty nasty bug in this application. Let's go ahead and fix it before we finish this video. First, I'm wondering if you know what the bug is. So take a moment, pause, and think about it. Okay, enough pausing. It's quit. So if we look at the quit command, we have a exit. Let's go ahead and look at exit. Tells the application to exit with a return code. After this function is called, the application leaves the main event loop and returns from the call to exec. Wait, what? The function returns a return code. If the event loop is not running, the function does nothing. So there's the bug right there. We're telling it to quit, but we haven't even entered into our event loop yet. So when we do this and we type the word quit, notice this cursor is still blinking. So this app is actually still running. We didn't really quit our application. Oh, all right. And to prove that, we can go into projects and then uncheck run in terminal. Say run, and you see we're now running inside of Qt Creator under the application tab, and we can type the word quit, and it's still running. Ta-da! So we're gonna force this to stop. That is a bug, we need to fix this. So there's a couple different ways we could do this. I'm gonna go back to run in terminal so we can see it in real time. First thing I'm gonna do, we really don't need the event loop. And we can play around with a not exit, but it really doesn't do anything. So let's try this really. And let's say quit. Now notice our application does stop because it says press return to close this window. So now this did actually quit, but it didn't really work the way you expect it because if the if we're not in an event loop, the function does nothing. So it basically does nothing. We break and then it goes all the way down here, right? So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to return zero, assuming that everything worked good. Because that's really all a exec does is it takes our Qt core application, enters an event loop, and then once it exits, it generates an integer. So we're just going to return zero. We don't even need this, to be brutally honest. So I'm just going to comment that out. And let's save and run. Try that again. So it's working as expected now. Now, I don't want to mislead you. There are probably tons of little bugs in this application because we're talking about this from a very simple beginner's level. We're only like 20 some odd videos into this series. So expect as we continue these videos, they're going to get more and more and more elaborate and complex and we'll probably have more difficult bugs to be brutally honest, but we'll go through this journey together and figure it out. If you're interested, the source code will be out on GitHub. I've been really bad about that, but I will 100% upload the code right after I upload this video.
I hope you enjoyed this video. You can find the source code out on github.com. If you need additional help, myself and thousands of other developers are hanging out in the Void Realms Facebook group. This is a large group with lots of developers and we talk about everything technology related, not just the technology that you just watched. And if you want official training, I do develop courses out on udemy.com. This is official classroom style training. If you go out there and the course you're looking for is just simply not there, drop me a note. I'm either working on it or I will actually develop it. I will put a link down below for all three of those. And as always, help me help you. Smash that like and subscribe button. The more popular these videos become, the more I'll create and publish out on YouTube. Thank you for watching.